Now, Hawaii and the Philippines have this connection, and it goes beyond Hawaii simply being a convenient halfway spot in between the Philippines and the mainland US. Whenever I'm around Hawaiian people, there's a sense of relatedness. I feel it. And yeah, there are similar geographic traits, being islands in the Pacific, similar physical features, but it goes even further than that. There are almost 350,000 Filipinos in Hawaii, which is nearly a quarter of the state's population. It's the state's second largest ethnic group. And Filipinos are more visible in Hawaii than any other part of the US. So why are the Philippines and Hawaii so deeply interconnected? Glad you asked. If you couldn't tell by the passion fruit lychee juice I've got going on here, I'm in Hawaii right now. I am on Oahu right now. My family and I are actually making our way towards the Philippines where we'll be spending over a month. It's our biggest journey as a family yet. The idea of taking a 15 hour plane journey with two babies and a toddler, well that's pretty daunting. So thank God Hawaii is where it is. Well, family made it out to Waikiki Beach. It's a pretty popular spot, so a little bit crowded, but not hard to see why. The water, the sand is fantastic. What? I've always felt a little bit uneasy with visiting Hawaii. I mean, its appeal is obvious, don't get me wrong, but I feel like many people, Americans in particular, have a very extractive Where relationship with it, particularly through tourism. It's too easy for us to think of it as our playground, our paradise. Without sparing its history any curiosity, how did this even become a state? I can't judge too hard though, up until recently I was in the dark about most of these things. But now, here's a chance to dig deeper. Alright, so Hawaii, the Philippines, and the connection, right? This involves complicated relationships with the US, complicated relationships with Japan, colonialism, and a whole bunch of other things. Let's get into this. So Hawaii and the Philippines have a good bit of distance between them, right? I mean, I just did that flight, trust me on that. But we know there are a lot of people who made that journey between the Philippine Islands and the Kingdom of Hawaii. Prior to colonialism, there was a lot of trade happening across the Pacific Ocean with the Dutch, the Spanish, the Chinese and Japanese sending trading vessels back and forth. They'd be bringing with them goods and seeds and also people and their customs. People have actually ran DNA tests on chickens in Polynesia and Hawaii and have confirmed that these have the same lineage as chickens found in the Philippines. You can also see fingerprints of these interactions in the languages of these two different places. Let's compare the numbers 1 through 9 in Tagalog and Hawaiian. Isa, dalawa, tatlo, kahi, lua, kolu, apat, lima, anim, ha, lima, uno, pito, walo, siam, Hiku, Walu, Iwa. So some of them are different, but some are dead on, and you can kind of see the relationship between the two. You've got words like niog in Tagalog and niu in Hawaiian, which means coconut. Ako and au. Oh, and ube and uhi. So yeah, trade and travel linked these islands long before the US arrived. But once that happened, things really started to shift. All right, so in the 1700s and 1800s, missionaries started settling in Hawaii. And for the most part, these were relatively pleasant interaction. They were well received by the Hawaiian people and they made a long-term home for themselves on the islands. These missionaries have kids and then a few generations go by uneventfully. But soon enough, their grandkids and great-grandkids discover there's actually a lot of money to be made from Hawaiian agriculture. After all, Hawaii has this rich volcanic soil and it's like perfect for growing sugarcane and there's a huge demand for sugar at this time. These intensive practices clashed with traditional Hawaiian values where uh, people tended to be very conscious about their relationship with their land. However, as these businesses thrived, they also started setting up militias and things to keep tighter and tighter control over their production. They really wanted to resist being controlled by the Hawaiian government. In 1893, these missionaries began a full-on overthrow of the Hawaiian monarchy. They managed to convince the U.S. government to support this by sending in the U.S. military. Queen Liliuokalani was overthrown in this attempt and replaced with a businessman, Sanford Dole. You might recognize his name. This more or less left Hawaii in the control of the sugar industry, 
in particular a group of corporations known as the Big Five. So at this moment in American history, you've got a lot of people who are gaining influence and gaining political power who are also big believers in war, imperialism, and expanding the U.S.'s influence all over the world. By now, the U.S. had completed its expansion towards the Pacific Ocean, and it was starting to eye islands and territories and pieces of land outside of the mainland. This included places like Cuba, Puerto Rico, the Virgin Islands, but also further across the Pacific, like Guam or the Marshall Islands, Hawaii after its coup, and yeah, the Philippines too. So at this time, the Philippines was under Spanish control. It had been under Spanish control for a long time, but we were starting to see big shifts in how Filipino people thought of themselves. Specifically, they were starting to think of themselves as Filipino people. Like, when the Spanish first arrived, the Philippines consisted of so many different languages and tribal identities, and the Spanish all referred to them as Indios. The term Filipino actually referred to full-blooded Spanish people who were born and raised in the Philippines. Anyway, there was this wave of revolutionary thinking led by people like Jose Rizal that all people who were native to the island, who claimed it as their home, were Filipinos. They formed a group with the goal of liberating the Philippines from Spanish control. They engaged Spain in combat, and they actually did quite well. Despite being seemingly unarmed, they wore down the Spanish army, and it looked like victory was close. Now, at the same time, there was a lot going on between the United States and Spain. A lot of the places the U.S. was really interested in were under Spanish control. Cuba, Puerto Rico, and so the U.S. frequently found itself at odds with Spain. They would frequently frame themselves as the good guys in these conflicts. I mean, that's what you do, right? The U.S. was seeking to liberate the people of fill-in-the-blank, from Spanish rule. And so they used this exact same narrative to invite themselves to the Philippines, just as the war between the Philippines and Spain was nearing its breaking point. The way this war wraps up is kind of bizarre. The US fights alongside the Filipinos, but at the same time holds these secret meetings with Spain. The Spanish realize they're not gonna win this war, but think it would be less embarrassing to lose to the United States than to their Filipino subjects. They essentially sit down with the US and script how this war is gonna end. Fighting alongside the US, the Philippines will defeat Spain. But instead of gaining its independence, it's simply gonna swap out one colonizer for another, the United States. A thing you can't ignore here is how paternalistic the US gets towards the Philippines, Hawaii, and all these other places. Before William Taft became famous as the bathtub president, he was appointed governor general of the Philippines. He told President William McKinley that our little brown brothers would need 50 or 100 years of close supervision to develop anything resembling Anglo-Saxon political principles or skills. Believe it or not, a term like little brown brothers wasn't intended to be derogatory. It was, but it wasn't intended that way. It simply reflected the way people in the US saw their position as superior to Filipinos. The idea was that these places would require US influence to become civilized and proper. Over in Hawaii, this meant banning the Hawaiian language from schools and commerce, uh, construction projects on sacred lands, or the revision of history that was being taught in schools. And it was in Hawaii in 1906 that these storylines began to merge. Okay, so remember at this time, Hawaii is basically being controlled by like five companies, mostly producing sugar. Well, at the time, the majority of the workers harvesting and producing the sugar were Japanese Americans. They worked long hours with low pay, so a bunch of them ended up going on strike. To replace their work and the lost hours, the Hawaii Sugar Planters Association turned to the newly incorporated Philippines. Recruiters brought over 125 Filipino migrant laborers to work in the sugar plantations. They were from the part of the Philippines known as Ilocos, which is why Ilocano is one of the most widely spoken languages in Hawaii still today. These workers became known as the Sakadas. Now, for the most part, these Filipino workers would have been uneducated, but they also would have had a ton of farming experience. Unfortunately, that combination made them a lot easier to exploit and control. They only made about two-thirds of what their Japanese counterparts were making, but since many of them were farmers or fisher folk, they kind of turned to themselves to solve their own needs when it came to hunger. They pay me 50 cents. No, I like cry, I like go back to Philippines. Still, to make sure that they didn't go on strike and ask for similar demands, they were kept separate from their Japanese co-workers. They were also used as leverage against the striking Japanese workers, basically saying, hey, we can just replace you. Kind of have to think about how that paternalistic attitude towards both Hawaii and the Philippines allowed for this dynamic to unfold. Throughout the 1920s, six to 8,000 Filipinos would have made the move to Hawaii. At first, the Sakatas who came over were just 
men by themselves, but over time they started bringing their families with them. The Cicadas started to see their identity as Filipino-American, an identity that was beginning to emerge more in places like California. Unfortunately, this also triggered a lot of backlash and violence. Filipino men were often portrayed as volatile and violent. At the time, the Honolulu Star Bulletin would disproportionately feature lead stories on the newspaper of violence committed by Filipinos. Statistically, Filipino men were a lot more likely to be charged with violent crimes. At the same time, though, the Cicadas were becoming more and more aware of their exploitation, particularly on the sugarcane plantations. They began forming strikes of their own. They participated in strikes alongside Japanese workers. And they began to organize more. Try to work as one, fight for our right. They joined unions, in particular the ILWU. As a result, they built solidarity with other ethnic groups. They created opportunities for housing and health care. They gained job security, retirement security, and voting rights. Their votes would actually be able to go to the candidate they wanted to win before they would just go in a big block to whoever their employer supported. This was pretty big in reshaping Hawaiian politics. So it's easy to forget that the whole time this was happening, Hawaii and the Philippines were both U.S. territories. This is what things looked like uh, through the 1930s, going into the 40s. Then this happened. On December 7th, 1941, Japan, like its infamous Axis partners, struck first and declared war afterwards. The once mighty Arizona now rests on Pearl Harbor's muddy bottom, a pitiful relic of its former self, a grim monument to the treachery of Japan. We like to think of that as the event that pulled the United States into World War II, but that was not the only attack that happened that day. Japan simultaneously bombed Guam and the Philippines. Franklin Roosevelt was actually going to reference those other attacks in his famous day that will live in infamy speech, but then I guess he changed his mind and crossed them out. Five months afterwards, Japan had invaded and fully seized control of the Philippines. There were three really brutal years under Japanese control that my grandparents lived through. And then... The terms and conditions upon which surrender of the Japanese Imperial forces is here to be given and accepted are contained in the instrument of surrender now before you. Almost immediately after Japan surrenders, the U.S. grants independence to the Philippines. Uh, in exchange for this, the Philippines signs a treaty where the U.S. would help rebuild the Philippines after the war. And in exchange, the Philippines would tie the peso to the U.S. dollar. They would be uh, pretty generous when it came to trade arrangements with their uh, abundant natural resources. Oh, and they would allow the U.S. to build an abundance of military bases on the Philippines, which is why you probably know a service member who's been stationed over there at some point. In 1959, Hawaii became the 50th state. Residents voted in favor of statehood by like 94%. While there were some natives that were still opposed to it, many agreed that having that representation in Congress would at least give them something that simply remaining a territory wouldn't. It's interesting to me how the Philippines and Hawaii were both territories for decades, but they ended up going in two totally different directions. One was eventually granted full statehood, the other independence and autonomy as its own nation. When, after 48 years of American sovereignty, the men and women of the Philippines received their independence. So much of this can be traced to the legacy of the Sakatas. When Hawaii was granted statehood, a lot of politicians at the time considered it an offset for Alaska's admission. They figured Alaska would be a reliably democratic state and Hawaii a reliably Republican stronghold, so they broke even. Obviously, those two states have gone in the total opposite direction as predicted. Out in Hawaii, NBC News can project Joe Biden is the winner. One of the big reasons, though, that Hawaii made that shift was that sugar plantation workers gained the right to vote for who they wanted to, not just who was on their employer's ticket. What's clear to me is that both these places have a past and present that are deeply intertwined and a future that'll be intertwined as well, especially as new generations think more deeply about what it means to be Filipino, what it means to be Hawaiian, and what it means to belong.